My name is Steve Hansen. I'm president and CEO and founder of Acme Lithium. Uh, we are an explorer and developer of world-class uh, lithium projects in North America. We've got two projects in the state of Nevada and two in Manitoba, and we're really excited about what's going to happen here in the remainder of 2022 and into 2023. Steve, good to see you again. Um, yeah, things hurting up at, uh, out there for sure. Um, and I want to talk about that. I do want to talk about the market in, in a second. I know you're right in the middle of a kind of three-day uh, investor conference as well. But um, saw the headline, Discovery at Clayton Valley. Um, tell us a little bit about that. How are you defining Discovery? Well, it's it's been great news for us. Obviously, we've been leading up to this point in our company. And uh, Clayton Valley really is the epicenter of, of brine development in the United States. And in fact, it's the only place where lithium has been produced in the U.S. It's hard to believe there's only one place that produces lithium in the United States. Albemarle, a New York Stock Exchange company, has been producing lithium there since 1966. We are their neighbor contiguous to the Northwest. And again, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have a world class asset. But certainly this new discovery is uh, putting us well on our way. Um, we started drilling here in June, completed drilling uh, in early July, and then results came out a couple weeks ago. And sure enough, we have lithium and it's increasing in intensity as we get deeper into the hole. There's very few brine holes that have been drilled in the United States, um, certainly in this region. And so we're fortunate that we have this project, its location, and now we're moving on to phase two, which is a major program for us as we advance this project and develop it. Okay, now I hear, I hear what you're saying. We, we, you're right, it's, it's kind of almost shocking in, in a way, um, criminal in a way that the, the US has kind of let that industry slide. But the, the question I was asking was around discovery because we've, again, we get companies come on here and they say after one hole, boom, discovery. I mean, we need to be clear about the definitions of, of that because those one hole discoveries don't always lead on to something. So what, again, give, give me some color around that. You know, Matt, you're correct. And absolutely, um, there's more work to be done here. Um, you know, I think the, the real reason why we call it a discovery is because we're into the same aquifer system that's been producing there for quite a number of years. We're in the same lithology. You know, we looked through historical records and we knew at what intervals we would be intersecting the upper ash layer, certain gravels and sands, the lower ash layer. Um, in our geophysics, we were targeting at 1,200 feet. We would be hitting the main zone and we hit it at 1,194 feet. So um, we're in the same ancient lake bed, again, in Clayton Valley that's been producing since 1966. Do we have the same resource? I'm not saying that at all, but certainly this first hole is giving us very strong indications. We're increasing lithium content and intensity as we get deeper in the hole, um, but we need to move on to phase two to prove this out. And phase two is gonna be a major program for us. We're gonna be drilling a test well, which will have a pump test involved in it. And then we're drilling three more exploration holes that are stepping out from this initial discovery hole. So really that program is really important to us and is gonna identify whether or not we have something in the way of a resource. I'm hoping that this program will get us to a resource. And that's certainly our vision here. We can triangulate from those exploration holes and this pump test and ultimately come up with an initial resource, assuming we have success, which is you know, not a given. Um, there's risk in this business. We're gonna do our best to facilitate and execute on this plan. And we're looking forward to hopefully having some good results. Right, and talk, talk to me about lithium in Nevada. Nevada, well established, mining jurisdiction, mining state, you know, very, very pro mining. Um, lithium brine, though, as you say, it's not well known in North America, South America, Chile, Argentina, you know, very well understood. Are you getting any kind of pushback on that one? Because I guess that's the fear for investors is the way that NGOs and activists kind of gather around moments like this. So, what, are you seeing anything? Well, you know, one of the benefits of brine is that, you know, I don't have to go and drill 40 or 50 or 100 drill holes like hard rock mining. And again, nothing against hard rock mining, but, you know, from a CapEx standpoint, uh, I'm not spending as much money and my footprint is going to be smaller as well. And then certainly there's known ways to produce uh, brine. And what's really interesting is technology is certainly changing the way we do things in the world, especially our industry. And there's a number of companies that are well financed that are developing direct lithium extraction. You'll hear this term DLE, and it's being utilized in Latin America as well as the United States. A number of companies out of San Diego, out of Houston, out of Alberta and around the world are developing these technologies. And in fact, there's a new DLE pilot plant being built right near us by Schlumberger and Panasonic. 
And so we're watching that very closely. We believe their brine is the same or similar to our brine. And if that DLE plant works for Schlumberger and Panasonic nearby, it certainly could work for us down the road. So we're, we're watching it very closely. I'm in discussions with a number of DLE companies. They'd like to get samples of our brine to see if they can test. And again, the benefit of DLE is we use less water, uh, there's less capex. It's a smaller footprint. Uh, it, it has uh, lots of environmental um, fa fa favorability to it. We can inject the water back into the aquifer. There's some great benefits to it, but it's still relatively unproven. We've got to advance these technologies over time. Again, we're watching them very, 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 uh, uh, very closely. I do believe because of this crisis we're facing for lithium that new technology is going to change the way we do our business. And again, we want to be responsible in what we do. Uh, we want to use best practices. And again, technology is changing the world and uh, we want to be a part of that. Right. It, it, your, your business, your model isn't defined by that you can can you still do salt bed can you do sort of traditional brine treatments here just because, because i say it, it daily is in its infancy sure. and lots of companies claiming to be able to supply yeah. all the world's demands i've heard one company come on here and tell me through their daily uh brine extraction technology um would would, would, would if this if the summer shade project doesn't kind of work out economically i'm sure technically it can but economically is the big question here um does that affect you well, I mean, we're we're next to the only lithium production in the United States since 1966 and one of the largest lithium producers in the world. Um, we're their neighbor and certainly collaborating with Abba Marley is something that we would investigate. You know, a very small pipeline could be created from our project to their facility. It would be a low cost way for us to produce lithium in partnership with a larger company. Again, time will tell. Our first step is actually get to a resource and get to a PEA and, uh, and, and make some strides here in this next fourth quarter and first quarter of 2023. But we have options. And there's very few companies that are next door to an existing producing facility. We have that benefit. Um, we have options. And again, we'll continue to investigate them in the interest of our shareholders and frankly, in the interest of having the lowest impact to our variety of stakeholders in the region. OK, um, so the the expanded drill program and the pump test program, you're, you're funded for that. Because last night we talked about you just raised some money, um, you get over five million bucks in the bank. So you're, you're good for that next phase? We're actually just two. under 12 million in the bank right now. So we're in we're in good shape. Gotcha. Um, I'll spend in the neighborhood of three to three and a half million dollars on this phase two program. So we're in really good shape. We've got all the funding we need for phase two. Um, and then obviously we're going to start to do some more exploration and work in Fish Lake Valley, which is the valley next door. And then obviously in Manitoba, we have a, a, a major program planned for this fall after a summer program. So we're in good shape cash wise. We've got all the money we need for Clayton Valley. Um, so we're excited to deliver on these catalysts. So the next uh, six months. Okay, so just just want to finish off in Clayton Valley then. So, uh, time time money's good. Time frame for that and time frame for news into the marketplace because that's what people will be looking for. We're working on procurement right now. We're working with all of our subcontractors and our team and putting a calendar together. Um, we're permitted for um, most of the work that we need to do. There's a couple of adjustments to permits that we need to do. We're hoping to have those in the next 30 days. Uh, I'm targeting to commence that phase two program early in Q4 2022. So not that far away. You know, I'm hoping to have that ready to go in the next 60 to 75 days. Um, again, subject to a variety of things um, that are out of my control, but we're working as diligently as possible to execute on phase two here this year in 2022. Okay, so some level of guidance over the next few months. Best case yep. scenario would be end of October. Um, realistically, sometime in November would be the time we'd like to be commencing this phase two program. Okay. Okay, perfect. And then with the phase two, two on the field work at uh, Fish Lake Valley, I mean, again, what, what, what are you planning there? Well, we're the valley over from Clayton Valley, just over the foothills, and we're in a, a flat valley there. We've done some initial exploration work. We've had good grade on surface and lithium samples. Again, it's early exploration, so we're planning to do some geophysics this fall. It's already been contracted, so that will take place. And then I'll make a drilling decision on Fish Lake Valley sometime uh, later in Q4 with a, a potential drilling program happening in the first half of 2023 at Fish Lake. This is a clay project, a lot of activity starting to happen in this region. And what's most interesting about 
our project at Fish Lake Valley is about two miles away is Ioneer. They're an Australian company, about a billion and a half dollars market cap. Uh, they're in late stage feasibility and the permitting process. It's uh, called Rhyolite Ridge. It's a lithium boron project. It's been known for a long time. We're contiguous to the west of that project. Um, in the in the, they're more in the foothills. We're in the flatter valley there. And there's been huge news out of Ioneer this summer. Um, Ford signed an offtake agreement, a supply agreement, uh, in late June, and then we saw Toyota and Panasonic sign, sign supply agreements in the last couple of weeks. So huge news for Ioneer, and frankly for our industry. I mean, we want success by our peers. Um, we want to see this domestic lithium crisis um, uh, solved over the next decade. And it has become a crisis. We can't rely on the handful of countries that produce lithium around the world. We need a domestic supply of lithium and the US is far, far behind. No, no I, think, I think essentially we, we did speak to them recently. Um, I think after the after the Ford deal um, and the eco Pro from last year, um, I think I think they're sort of taking a, th a third each, um, seven thousand tons each. Um, it's it's interesting seeing those sorts of companies coming up the food chain, as it were. I, you know, um, up, up going back upstream a little bit because they're they're a bit nervous about securing supply chain for the next five and and ten years. And you know, going to the metal traders isn't necessarily an option anymore, um, purely because the supply demand fundamentals just make it more and more uncertain so no, I, I i hear you i hear you on that um just just on the sorry you mentioned manitoba there a second ago as well you've done a summer program what did you learn from that and then what's the winter program actually going to entail well manitoba in, in the southeastern region is interesting too um the only production in lithium is actually at the tanko mine which is in southeastern manitoba it's been off and on producing what are called lcts lithium cesium and tantalum since about 1969, it was bought by Sinomine, a very large Chinese company, a number of years ago. It's been in production recently. In fact, that lithium ore from the Tanko mine is being put on flatbed trucks and then on rail cars and then shipped to Vancouver, put on freighters and then shipped to China for processing. So um, it's a known region of pegmatites. Pegmatites are rocks where spodumene is found with lithium. Um, there's massive pegmatite fields throughout this region. Um, we've secured a, a large land position uh, just south of the Tanko mine. We're about a mile away from the border of our property. And again, I want to mention that just because we border an existing mine or a deposit doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have success. It's perspective. And it's it's very good. And the fact that we have um, three regions where we're next to existing lithium production or near-term production is very, very rare. We're very fortunate to have this portfolio. It's one of the best portfolios you'll find in lithium companies. In Manitoba, again, we've got two projects, one south of the Tanko mine and then one about 12 miles north of there. We've been working on those projects in parallel. Um, we've had two crews on there all summer, actively sampling, mapping, looking at structures, and then we've done airborne geophysics over both those properties in parallel. So we're just putting that data together um, it's been a, a major program for us all summer. And then I've got permits right now that are in at the Manitoba government. Um, we've had first review uh, about a drill program that we're hoping to commence sometime in Q4 of 2022. So again, not that far away where we'll be drilling in Manitoba. Again, excited to get started. Um, uh, interesting couple of projects and we're hoping to make a discovery there too, uh, leading into 2023. So we've got three exploration programs ongoing in Manitoba, at Fish Lake Valley in Nevada, and in Clayton Valley. So lots of news flow coming for our shareholders, investors, and we have enough capital to do all these programs. So we're in good shape, um, certainly for Q4 and Q1 into 2023. You are in good shape, in good, good shape financially, and you've got a portfolio of assets through which you're working on, okay? But here's, here's the thing, that's getting, it's getting harder and harder um, to, for companies to navigate current markets, right? Inflation, high we're seeing over 10 percent here and people talking about 22 percent by the middle of next year um it, it, that, that that's quite painful we've had many companies come on um and they've you know blown their brains out on the on their capex when they've gone to do their final uh, economic studies um they're so, some of that transitory cost may come down again the the, the fuels explosive chemicals side side of things some of it salaries uh, consultants, etc., may may not. So it, it's a very fluid 
time. But for companies like you and the model that you've described to me in the past is you're going to have to work out the most efficient way to spend your capital to paint the right picture for the right person to say, do you know what? This is not a marginal. This is not a marginal asset. This is something that I can make money on, and I can raise money on, and I can advance. Right. So you've got you've got to understand all of that to be able to deploy your capital now. An early stage exploration company, may, may, may I add. But if you don't spend your money wisely or efficiently, it's going to cause you problems further down the line. Or certainly, the cost of money is going to get more expensive further down the line as well. So, how how are you managing all of that? And how are you viewing all of that? Well, fortunately, I've um, I've been in this business for 30 years working on all four continents and um, I've made lots of mistakes um, and you learn from those mistakes. And I've been on boards and advisor to boards and, you know, I've kind of figured out uh, the do's and don'ts. And, and over my time, there's some things in my control and some things out of my control. But what we've been able to do is to put as much money into the ground as possible. We have a very small team. Um, and so our GNA is actually quite small for a company that's as active as we are. We use some top consultants and subcontractors. Um, we put them out for bidding and we've got relationships. So we get, we get pretty good deals. And in fact, in my Clayton Valley program that we had this summer, we came under budget. So you don't hear that very often where you come under budget. Um, and, you know, I, I think what one one comment that our shareholders have made is they're surprised at how much work we're able to do in a short period of time. We're able to meet milestones. So, you know, I want to set milestones and meet them. Um, our team works hard. We've got competent people and we know how what things cost. Um, we are seeing inflation, of course. You know, costs are going up. Um, you know, we'll have to manage that. And so I want to be efficient with our capital. You know, we're 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 not going as fast a pace at Fish Lake, partly because there's only so many things that we can do. Again, as I mentioned, we'll make a drilling decision on Fish Lake towards the end of the year. But part of that will be is my visibility on future capital. I have enough money to, to spend in Manitoba. I have enough money to spend in Clayton Valley. We'll do a little bit of work in Fish Lake. But I will need more capital sometime in 2023. I can stretch my capital for a long time. I have flexibility. I can slow down and speed up as we go, depending upon how windows open in the capital markets. We're very fortunate. We have some very good institutional shareholders that have come along twice now in financings. I assume they will come along again if we were to finance again. And I have a lot of interest from a number of U.S. investment banks, Canadian investment banks and investors overseas, whether it be Asia and Europe who are interested in our project. I could raise more capital right now if I wanted to, but I want to spend the capital we have. Uh, have some catalysts and hopefully raise money at a higher valuation. Every finance that I've done to date has been at a higher price. Um, that's my goal. Um, it may not happen, but my goal here is to raise money at, at, at uh, stair-stepped higher prices as we go, as we build value for our shareholders. So, you know, there's interest in our company right now. Um, we're going to um, execute on this plan over the next, uh, you know, three to six months. And then I'll look to raise a larger financing sometime in 2023. Talking of which, I think I mentioned it at the beginning of the show, you're in the middle of an investor conference at the moment. So lithium's hot. Um, what, ty what type of investors are you speaking to? Are these kind of late late to the party, so to speak? Or are the, how, how, how would you describe them? Well, I'm in, in day day two of a three-day conference, and I actually did a webinar yesterday to some investors in the middle of it as well. So, you know, part of my job as CEO and president and founder is I'm a spokesperson for the company. And, you know, we are competing in capital markets. It is a competition. I'm competing with thousands of other companies out there that are looking for the same or similar capital. So, you know, for me, it's the company that's most understood, um, that communicates well, is the one uh, in, in our vision. And obviously, opportunity is, is going to get the capital. But I have to have fundamentals, too. So for me, part of my uh, job here is to continue to present to new investors who are interested in the lithium market or particularly lithium companies like ours. So we've had a cross section of investors from family offices to institutions, to investment banking firms, to strategics, to mining companies. So it's been a broad range. You know, I had a call with South Africa this morning, Singapore and China yesterday, Europe yesterday, throughout the Americas. So we're attracting interest from investors all around the world. And again, we want to get on the radar. You know, they may not invest in us today, but we're hoping that as we grow our business, they'll come along with us and, uh, and become a shareholder. 
And in terms of the questions, I know, okay, you're in the middle, of, not even quite in the middle of day two yet, but in terms of yesterday's questions to you, what, what do you think are the most pertinent questions um, in terms of them understanding the thesis for this, first of all, and, and secondly, you know, how you have differentiate yourself in their eyes? Well, I think what's clear is is people are recognizing that there are very few companies that have a portfolio like uh, ours as a as an early explorer, and that the location of our projects are um, are exceptional. Um, and again, I'm not saying that we have a, a major resource because we're next door to an existing project, but it certainly is a good sign. Uh, there's infrastructure, uh, power, roads access talented people in around these projects and a long history of exploration as well and mining in Nevada and in Manitoba. So we're in great jurisdictions. You know, the biggest question I get is about timelines. You know, when will we be producing lithium? And so for those that um, don't understand sort of the mining cycle, these things do take, take time. There's various stages we have to go through. But what's important here is, you know, the auto manufacturers and the technology companies like Samsung and LG uh, and, and uh, chip, you know, the manufacturers of, of our tablets and laptops and any of the battery metals that we're using today, and even for grid storage, they're looking 10 to 15 years out. They have to plan that far in advance, you know, as they are, are bringing out new vehicles. I mean, GM isn't looking for lithium two years from now. They're wondering where are they going to get lithium seven to 10 years from now? That's their concern. So, you know, even though this cycle for us takes some time, people always ask, you know, when are you going to be in production? And I say, well, there's a number of steps we're going to have to go through. We have to get to a resource, then we have to get to PEA, then pre-feasibility, then feasibility and permitting, and then hopefully one day we'll be in production. And my goal here is actually to find a larger partner who can assist us with that. That's my number one goal in the next 24 months as we advance the company, is to find a very large partner who knows about building mines, who has deep pockets, and can help us develop these projects in partnership. So strategic, strategic mining partner not a strategic industry partner in terms of uh, both or do you, you care know, where the um, money comes from right we we ultimately if we define a resource sometime in the next 24 months you know we certainly believe we'll be in conversations with off takers we'll be in conversations with large uh, uh commodity companies whether they provide capital or whether they are miners um you know what's interesting is never in my 30 years have i seen large companies contact junior companies at this early stage. I'm getting called, cold called, by large companies wondering where are we in, in the process, uh, in the supply chain process. Um, I've never in my career had this happen this early. It doesn't mean they're gonna invest and it doesn't mean that, but they wanna follow us. They wanna know in their spreadsheet, where does Acme Lithium potentially fit, fit in three, five, seven, 10 years from now in their planning. So it's an interesting time. We're seeing uh, large companies step into the lithium market at an earlier stage. And I'm hoping that we can have, um, um, you know, that kind of catalyst happen to us in the next couple of years. Yeah, it's, it's been a fascinating couple of years. If you, if you look at some of the big banks forecast two years, just two years ago, so wrong, so wrong. The, this, the, the industry is moving, the, the, the EV market thesis is moving at a huge pace uh which the which banks are having to readjust their forecasts every every quarter uh, at the moment so no very interesting times you're you're at least you're in the right space and the right thesis and the rest of it well it's all easy stuff i'm sure you, you you're in control <laughs> sure sure of course yeah no we've got some things in our control we're uh, we're working hard and um you know we really want to deliver on behalf of our shareholders but you know, there's uh, it's a risky business, too, and there's some things out of my control. And that's really what's in Mother Earth. Right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you can do the best work above ground and have the best people. But, you know, we need to make uh, significant discoveries here to create value. And uh, we hope to do so in the coming months.